But welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Griffin. Uh, thank you for joining us here for the second webinar in our series. Uh, I work for Ohio State Sustainability Institute uh, at The Ohio State University, and I also serve as a member of the Green Spot Advisory Board. So this webinar is part of a series uh, that kind of showcases the work of the Green Spot Advisory Board and several of its committees. If you are not familiar with Green Spot, it's the city's main program for engaging uh, communities on ways to live more sustainably. So it is membership based, but it's totally free to join. So if you're not a member, definitely check out uh, the Green Spot website. You can just Google it real quick and it'll be the first thing that pops up. But again, totally free to join and it helps you track how your uh, everyday actions can make big environmental impacts. So before we dig into our presentation today, I wanted to turn it over briefly to Dave Celebrezzi, who's the Green Spot coordinator for a couple of announcements. Great, thanks Matt and welcome everybody. Uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, flexibility in uh, my last minute email. So I'm glad that you all got that and are here for this. I just wanted to mention real quick, uh, 30 seconds. Um, we do have a Green Spot Community Backyards program, which does offer $50 rebates on trees and native plants and rain, and rain barrels as well. And one of those things you can get, uh, although the rebates are running out. So we're towards the end of the season now. Uh, but I did want to mention that because next year we're doing it. We're going to add more money to the, the pot, so we'll be able to give away more rebates. And then also in the chat, in the chat feature, I'll uh, post a link to the, the city's urban forestry master plan process that's being led by um, our, our Department of uh, uh, Recreations and Parks. So I'll put that in there. And I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Dr. Joe Boggs for uh, being available for this. And thanks, Matt, for being the host and I'm going to go ahead and cut my camera and cut my mic. Outstanding. I, uh, I do appreciate the honorary doctorate. No, it's just Mr. Joe Boggs. So uh, Joe Boggs with Ohio State University Extension and I have a courtesy appointment with the Ohio Department of Entom or OSU Department of Entomology. So to get started, just this title, Connect the Dots, Flowering Plant Diversity, Pollinators and Pest Management. Uh, this is a presentation that I started developing a few years ago based on, uh, well, based on standing on the shoulders of giants. There's, I'm going to be citing some research done at Ohio State as well as University of Maryland and elsewhere. This is not a new concept. As a matter of fact, this is actually mirroring what nature does all along. So my first point <clears throat> is what we're going to really focus on is flowering plant diversity from butterfly gardens and beyond. Of course, we have these locations, butterfly gardens, where we hope to attract pollinators. And of course, you know, some of these are formal gardens. You know, we have this really nice butterfly, giant butterfly to tell butterflies where to, where to visit, right? And then we have, you know, parks that have this diversity. Now, this is the main point here. As uh, prior to getting started, uh, we were talking a little bit about, you know, uh, folks being nervous about doing the wrong or right thing. And my message is, if you look at what's in front of you at Smaley Park, Riverfront Park down in Cincinnati, or uh, Wings Spread, the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, design uh, uh, <clears throat> building in uh, Racine, Wisconsin, all I'm saying is this is what we're hoping that people accomplish. Diversity in flowering plants, naturalized areas, and so on. It's all about increasing flowering plant diversity. I'm not presenting recipes. I'm not gonna go through and say, you know, use these as opposed to that. You decide what you would like to see. It's that easy. But don't forget about trees and shrubs. You know, when we talk about flowering plants too often, we focus on annuals and perennials, which is fine, but trees and shrubs are also very important. One of my favorite, as a matter of fact, is button bush. Very odd looking, very interesting looking flower. Just look at that. And I, I never noticed before. It kind of reminds you of something, doesn't it? I don't know. At any rate, it is a strong attractor of pollinators. Even when the fruit you know, uh, goes past, even when the flowers start going into the fruit stage, they, they provide a beautiful display. Nice glossy foliage. And this is button bush in a wetland. So it does do very well in wet areas. Spirea, easy to grow, a lot of different types. And here we have a hoverfly being attracted. White fringe tree, 
white fringe tree belongs to the olive family. So when those fruits develop, it, they attract blue jays, cardinals, mockingbirds, and turkeys, but the flowers themselves attract a lot of pollinators. Serviceberry, amelanchia, which produces wonderful fruit, which is edible. Black locust, one of my favorites, as a matter of fact, this long, you know, it belongs to the same family as beans. So this does look like bean-like. Catalpa, again, a <laughs> one of my favorite trees can be can be a little rough looking sometimes in the landscaping, but pollinators love it. Little leaf linden, silver linden, American persimmon, which you have the added benefit again of a very good fruit. If you wait till a little bit later in season to harvest it, obviously. Hedge maple, trident maple. Now these maples provide uh, provide nectar very early in the season. There is one thing that I'm going to stress, and that is we hope that you do look at plants, different plants. So you have a flowering display that's occurring season long. It starts in the spring, goes into the fall. For example, you know, right now, the golden rods, we have 22 native species in Ohio, and they're a late season bloomer that attracts and supports pollinators. Bottle brush buckeye, Aeschylus parviflora beautiful plant and Ohio buckeye. And of course, you know, I, we have to recognize the Ohio State bus, buckeye, Escalonius natosa. So that brings me to my second point. My second point is that insects suffer from a very serious image problem. There's no doubt about it. I mean, we have our homes and yes, different insects show up over time, more insects than the spiders show up to eat the insects and things we don't even know what they are show up. And that can cause people to panic and do something that maybe we would like to think about a little bit more. And for that, I'd like for us to consider a different perspective relative to insects. When I say flitter or flutter, what comes to mind? Well, things like butterflies and moths that add animated beauty to the landscaping. That's a, a service of insects that I think that sometimes we we just simply don't think about. Animated beauty, the flowers are beautiful, but as these things flitter and flutter around, they are really gorgeous to see. And things zipping and buzzing around like hummingbird moths. And a pollinator, an enemy of other insects like this feather-legged fly. Now you have to admit, this is a fly, but it's, it's, it's kind of pretty, isn't it? But this is a twofer, a pollinator and an en enemy of insect pests. We're gonna talk more about that. Here we have little pollinator uh, 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 flies. Now we can tell they're flies because they only have two wings. Bees have four wings. As a matter of fact, the order for flies, diptera, D-I-P-T-E-R-A, P-T-E-R-A means wing and die, D-I, means two. So flies have two wings. People think these are sweat bees. These are little flies. So plant pollination, very, very important. Now, insects then are beneficial. They add animated beauty to the landscape, but they are also pollinators. Now, one third, there's no doubt about this, one third of our food supply depends directly on plant pollinators. That is supported by research. But some of you may have heard a little different way. How many of you heard this? One of every, every three bites of food depends on bees. I used to repeat that, that, but we need to dig into this a little bit deeper. Is this really true? I mean, we see this. Here we have it, you know, believe it or not, you have a bee to thank for every one in three bites of food. Bees pollinate 80% of the world's plants, including 90 different food crops. One of every three or four. Well, they're kind of hedging on that. When the bites of food you eat is thanks to bees. Huff posts, one of every three bites of food depends on bees. Let's save them. Well, there's no doubt we want to save bees, but we need not to overstate what's going on here because this is really fake news. I hate to tell you that, but you can... You can look into this, and again, this fits right into everyone's entitled their own opinion, but not their own facts. One of my favorite quotes, just the facts. If you want to so, you know, find out more about this, Google Scholar is a wonderful place to look at scientific research. That's what it's dedicated to. So you can do, uh, you can do web searches dedicated to just looking into the scientific literature 
a literature review. And in this case, I typed in importance of pollinators. And here is a, here's a paper that came up, importance of pollinators in changing landscapes for world crops. Now, <clears throat> proceedings of the Royal Society B, the biological sciences, this is a very august publication. If you get published in this, well, you've really arrived. Importance of pollinators in changing landscapes for, the, for world crops, 2006. Now, as a matter of fact, this is cited as being the original place for that one in three bytes thing. But you can see that it, this paper did not exactly say that. 60% of the, this is from the paper, 60% of the global production comes from crops that do not depend on animal pollination. Well, that's interesting. 35% from crops that depend on pollinators. So, okay, there is kind of a one third thing going on there, right? But are all the pollinators bees? As a matter of fact, and I pulled this out of the paper, this isn't a direct citation, but what they cite is animals such as insects, yes, including bees, as well as birds and bats. So when we say one third of our food depends on bees, what happened to the birds and bats? Yeah, the birds certainly don't like that, right? And the bee, or the bats are also being overlooked. Well, bees have enjoyed a better marketing campaign is my perspective. As a matter of fact, and pollinators are very important and I'm not denigrating bees by any means. I don't want anybody to come away thinking that. I'm just saying that we must think more broadly when it comes to pollinators. There are many different types of pollinators. So let's take a look with a little taxonomy here. Now this is, I have pictures of four orders of insects and anyone on this Zoom could identify these orders. I mean, you know, as I already said, this is fly, a fly. It has two wings, D-I-P-T-R-A. Colio means sheath. There's a beetle. Sheath winged. That's what that means. Lepido. Lepido means scale, scale wings, membranous wings. We all know these orders. We know bees and wasps. We know butterflies and moths. We know beetles. We know flies. So I say mildly taxing taxonomy. If you can identify to the insect order, you're well along the way of identifying the insect. That's kind of a nice thing about insects. But let's take a look at flies, order diptera. Now, a few years ago, when I really started taking a lot of pictures of pollinators, I, 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 I set out to develop a, a, an image library of pollinators. Something started happening along the way. I kept having these flies coming in and photobombing my pictures. You know, they would come in and be like, and I would have to shoo them away so I could get pictures of the real pollinators, right? Well, that's what I was thinking until I read this paper. And this is 2001. Diptera are the second most important order of flower visiting and flower pollinating insects in the world, insects worldwide. And contrary to popular belief, it isn't just stinky flowers that attract flies. They're all over the place. I mean, just go out right now, goldenrod is blooming, and notice how many flies are coming into goldenrod. They don't just, they're not just attracted. Now, those flowering plants that produce stinky flowers, yes, okay, they're specifically sitting out to attract flies, but flies will come to a lot of other things. They are the second most important order. Isn't that kind of incredible? The forgotten flies, the importance of non surfed diptera in pollinators, a lot of research on this. So don't tell them to buzz off. So now let's reorder these orders, bringing order to pollinators. The most important order are bees and wasps, hands down. But now look what's happening. The second most important order are the flies and third are the moths and butterflies and fourth bringing up the rear are the beetles. Very important, but they're not as important as flies. Let's take this maybe one step too far. More false insect marketing. The butterfly garden then based on what I've just told you should actually be called the fly garden. That may be too far. There are limits though. <clears throat> Sometimes we have plants that for whatever reason in their selection start attracting 
too many flies. Some hydrangeas now are doing this. We don't understand it. These, these flowers don't stink, but look at the number of flies coming in. And that's a bit of a challenge. They do have a friend and, friends and family plan. To be fair, there are butterfly gardens that do more than just support pollinators. A true butterfly garden, like our Cincinnati Botanical Garden and Zoo, is dedicated to attracting and supporting butterflies for their beauty, not just for pollinators. So it includes plants that support caterpillars. You can see the signage there. And we have these in several locations. If you have a butterfly garden, consider it also, consider also planting plants that support the caterpillars. That's a little side note. There is a butterfly conundrum though out there. Are they pollinators or are they nectar thieves? There's quite a bit of debate going on right now in this area. And we have to be a little careful not to get pulled in too far. But if we look at a monarch, what do we see here relative to pollination? They have very long legs. I'm not denigrating monarchs. I'm just saying, okay, let's put things in proper perspective. See that long proboscis that goes down into the flower? How much pollen are they really picking up with these long legs and that long soda straw proboscis? as compared, let's say, to other Lepidopter, like this little skipper that's just covered in pollen. Again, you have to weigh, you know, what are the pollinators that are really pollinating? And then we have some that are called nectar thieves. Bumblebees, they are fantastic pollinators. You can see why. I love the way they just kind of shove their head all the way down into the flower. Look at that, just grab hold of it. They really pick up a lot of pollen, crawl right into the flowers. That is a real good pollinator. And you can see the pollen stuck all over this bumblebee. Carnivore incognito, this is the blue wing wasp, Scolia dubia. And it is called a solitary ectoparasite. So what is it really doing? Of course, it's coming in. I just took this last uh, Friday, coming in the goldenrod, blue winged. You can see the blue tint to the wings. What they do is they lay eggs on the outside of this. So this is a green June beetle, huge grub. They'll lay their eggs on the outside of this. And then when the eggs hatch, they zip in and feed on the inside. That's why they're called ectoparasites. So what's the message here? This is a recurring theme. This is a pollinator. You can see, again, look at the pollen stuck all over it and an enemy of insect pests, an insect pest. Recurring theme, I think I'm gonna build on that. Predators and parasitoids, they prey on other insects. I love this quote. The whole nature is a conjugation of the verb to eat and the active and passive. So a little short segue here. Let's talk a little more about what do we mean by predators and parasitoids and so on. Well, these are entomophagous insects. Entomo means arthropods, including insects. Phage means to eat. So entomophagous are insects or other arthropods that eat other insects or other arthropods. And we can divide them into things we're very familiar with, predators. Predators consumes the host from the outside. They kill the host. We know lady beetles and we know praying mantids are predators. We know that, we're taught that very early on, but look at what else we have as predators. Paper wasps and yellow jackets are predators. They eat things like caterpillars and sawflies. They feed these to their young. And there's a very important predator, symbol of our country, right? There's another predator. These are just smaller versions of these. That's my point here. Sometimes we forget insects are animals and they're just smaller versions of other animals. There's a predator, doesn't like the glass at the zoo though. Can't be a real predator. Now, a parasite feeds on the host, does not usually kill the host outright. As a matter of fact, a definition of a successful parasite is it doesn't kill its host. This mosquito, for example, yes, this is a mosquito that could spread an encephalitic virus. So I'm taking a little bit of risk taking this picture, but that mosquito does not have in its little mosquito brain the idea it's going to spread an encephalitic virus or other mosquitoes that might spread something that produces malaria. They don't have that in mind. Those are hitchhikers. Mosquitoes are usually pretty successful parasites. They don't kill us. They might itch us to death, but the point of it is, 
is if you wanted one insect to kill another insect, well, it's probably not a good idea to consider parasites because they're not very effective at killing their hosts. So in entomology and other areas of biology, we have this subgroup of parasites. It's almost like a mix between predator and parasite. It's called a parasitoid. They do kill the host. They eat them from the inside out. And what you're seeing here are cocoons of a parasitoid wasp. The immature wasps are finished with these caterpillars and they come to the surface, spin a cocoon, and of course new adults emerge. So let's talk a little more about this. This is a human parasitoid, for example, if you remember the movie, right? And busting out of there. Well, at any rate, a parasitoid. Now we all might recognize what's happening here. This is actually tobacco hornworm. It's in the same genus as tomato hornworm. They both eat tomatoes because tobacco is a solanaceous plant related to tomatoes. What's happening here though, is you see one has been parasitized with a parasitoid wasp. The other hasn't. Now I want you to, to uh, I want to note something here. These are both the same age. And you can see the one that is being affected by the parasitoid is much smaller. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Of course, you know, this is what we often see, right? It's amazing how well they blend in with our tomatoes until we see this. But we're going to focus on this other caterpillar called a catalpa hornworm. It's in the family Sphingidae or Sphinx moths. These are very pretty moths. The hornworm idea comes from this horn on the back end. And of course, they feed on their namesake host, Catalpas, and this is what they do. And so what's happening here? This caterpillar is doomed. These, again, are cocoons of a very specific type of parasitoid called Catessa congregata. And I don't know if you can hear the sounds. I apologize. I don't know if I initiated that when I started. But at any rate, Catessa congregata, and so she uses her ovipositor. Ovipositor is what we would also call a stinger. Ova, egg, positor, layer. So she's going to lay eggs inside that caterpillar. Now, what's happening here? What exactly happened? Well, let's open up the caterpillar. We see, okay, there are eggs. But that's not the only thing that she did. She injected venom. Well, of course, we know that they do that. I mean, you get stung by a wasp. What hurts you is the venom. She also injected a virus and the specialized cells that were attached to the eggs called teratocytes. Now, what do these things do? Well, the virus suppresses the immune system. So no rejection of the eggs and teratocytes. Yes, insects have an immune system, just like we do where we're hoping it'll work against the COVID virus, right? That's what we're, or I mean the coronavirus rather. That's what we're hoping. Well, insects do the same thing. So it'd be a bad thing if the immune system rejected the eggs and teratocytes. So that's what the virus does. The teratocytes then release a hormone called T-hormone that coupled with the venom suppressed development. So that's why that tobacco hornworm was smaller, the two tobacco hornworms, the one that was smaller, because if the caterpillar pupated, you can just imagine what would happen to the immature wasps. They would be doomed. So it's a good idea to keep them as caterpillars until the parasitoid wasp is finished with their development. But here's something kind of interesting. I used to tell this story and not even think about this until one year I started, I was doing some teaching and I realized, okay, now, where does that virus come from? Is the virus, you know, on Catessa? Is it on the wasp? Is it someplace? Where does it come from? Well, it turns out researchers looked into this. They couldn't find the virus inside the, cat, the uh, wasp. They couldn't even find it on the outside of its ovipositor. They could only find it in terms of being injected, what was injected into the caterpillar. So where did it come from? Well, here is a really interesting paper, Journal of Virology. Baroque viruses, biological weapons integrated into the wasp's genome. In other words, folks, the wasp creates the virus right out of its own DNA. The virus is encoded into the wasp DNA. I think that's just incredible. I think it's mind blowing. As a matter of fact, when you think about how some of these things work, 
And here we can see Contessa congregata. We can see the little immature wasp larvae coming through the surface. And then, of course, they, uh, there's a little bit of leakage of the blood of the caterpillar, the hemolymph. And we can see that the larvae are spinning up cocoons. And of course, that's what we really see. Death is not immediate, though. It does take a little while, but I'll tell you, this caterpillar was dead within a few hours of me taking this picture. It looked like this. This is a dead caterpillar. The idea being this, that the immature wasp larvae are pre-programmed to eat everything inside that caterpillar during their development, except things that will kill the caterpillar. So they leave alone the organs and things that the caterpillar is, uh, uh, you know, depends on to stay alive. But eventually, right before pupation, the larvae of the parasitoid wasp eats everything. And so it does kill the caterpillar. Now it also, the same Catessa congregata also works on uh, tobacco and tomato hornworms, as well as laurel sphinx moths and a number of other sphinx moth caterpillars. That's why sometimes it's called the hornworm wasp. Well, they had animated beauty, pollinators, predators, and parasitoids. These are all the good things about insects, but this is one thing that few people sometimes recognize. When I hear the question, what are insects good for? My answer is, without insects, we wouldn't be here. Now, that may seem kind of like a bold statement, but it's true. If you consider what we mean by keystone organisms, in all terrestrial ecosystems, what does that mean? Why do ecologists use this? When they use it, they're referring to an arch, the keystone in an arch. So just a demonstration, what happens? We have a Roman legion here, phalanx coming up and they're gonna demonstrate what happens when we pull the keystone. So they cover up, we're gonna pull the keystone, what happens? the arch collapses. That's what keystone, that's what keystone organisms mean. All terrestrial e ecosystems, if we removed insects, all terrestrial ecosystems would do just what this arch did. They would collapse. They're very important then, but some insects are pests. There's no doubt about it. Some cause destruction to things that we would like to have, trees, shrubs, annuals, perennials, corn, soybeans, they are pests. Now I do a diagnostic walkabout back when I could do face-to-face -face training. Uh, I do a monthly diagnostic walkabout with the, the green industry. And this is one at the Boone County Arboretum. Uh, here we're at Spring Grove Cemetery, actually Spring Grove uh, Arboretum and Cemetery. And here we are at the Cincinnati Zoo, uh, uh, Cincinnati Botanical Garden and Zoo. And there was something that I noticed years ago at these locations, particularly those locations where you had a high diversity of flowering plants. What I noticed, and this is the director of horticulture, Steve Foltz, taking the group around, Steve would be talking about plant selection, nice plants for landscaping. My role was to be looking for insect pests and plant diseases, so pests and diseases. And I would be trailing along, looking hard, and not finding many pests. Now they do no spraying at the zoo, no insecticide applications for two reasons. Number one is obviously protection of the animals in their care at the zoo. The other is just simply, how do you go about spraying when you have all these people visiting all the time? But that's not the only reason. The other reason is they always are very good with only considering doing something when they had a pest problem and they just did not have pest problems. Again, what was going on? Well, the answer was actually in front of me. The answer was something where the research had already been done. Pivotal research that's been done at Ohio State and elsewhere under the header of disasters by design. And these are the papers. Now, Dan Herms used to be our department chair for OSU entomology. He's now with Davy Tree. Mike Raup and Paula Shrewsbury are both at the University of Maryland in the Department of Entomology. They're, they're married. By the way, just a little side note, I know Paula <laughs> gets a kick when I do this, but 
if you notice, Dan is standing next to the Stanley Cup, and Mike is actually eating a periodical cicada. Paula had to work with these two guys, and you can kind of see the look on her face, right? My point, though, is these are pivotal research papers, and we're going to look very closely at some of these. Disasters by Design, Paula and Dan and Mike, 2012, Outbreaks Along an Urban Gradients. What do we mean by urban gradients? Well, urban gradients go this route, starting with an Eastern deciduous forest. Look at all the diversity in this forest. And then what do we do? Well, we come along and we start taking the forest down. I love this quote, suburbia is where the developer bulldozes out the trees then names the streets after them. I always liked that quote until I saw it firsthand, not too far from where I live. <laughs> If you take a look, actually, this is this. The bulldozer is running exactly where these homes are. And look at the name of the road, the street, Woodview Way. I, I've been wanting to go there some night and just put Woodview went away because that's exactly what happened there. Well, this is the gradient we're referring to, going from the diversity of force. Of course, I'm not denigrating that either because, you know, we have to be able to build homes, but sometimes our decisions should be examined maybe later on. For example, here we have trees left after the parking lot was put into place. Look at this, I guess left here, you know, to shade the cars until this big oak finally dies and falls onto the cars. It's a real problem, it's a real challenge, but it's no one's fault, it's just asphalt. Monocultures by a natural selection. If we take a look at this street, this is my street actually, and there was actually this is mostly cornfields before, but before that was forests. But now look at what's happening. We're just coming in with replanting trees, and sometimes we do this in a monoculture. In this entire parking lot for this large uh, hospital complex, there are only four species of trees being used in this entire complex. Sometimes we put trees above the road. Urban gradient then, we start with high diversity. Then with the first level reduction, we still have some of the trees. Second level, fewer trees. Fourth level, we finally get in, or third level, we finally get into monocultures. This entire parking lot is nothing but calorie pairs. So this is the urban gradient we're talking about. And what we're also talking about is moving from high diversity to no diversity. So what's the relationships between plant abundance, diversity and diversity of arthropod pests? We go back to that paper that I cited and they looked at 212 landscapes and with they, they separated the landscapes into two groups of the high diversity being about three species or low diversity being about three species, high diversity about 38 species. So that's how they separated them out. And then they took a look at what was going on in these landscapings. And so simple or the low diversity, high diversity complex landscapes. And if you look at generalist predators, now for those of you that have had some statistics or sadistics as we used to call it. If you see this plus or minus 2.6, for example, well, adding it or subtracting it to 13.1, if it crosses this number with it being subtracted or added to that, that number, then these are not statistically different. But as you can very well see, in terms of predators, look at the number of predators in a complex landscape. Look at the number of spiders. Then we go down to a just a plant bug pests. That doesn't seem like a big number, but of course you don't have pests throughout the landscaping, but you look at the difference, many more pests in the simple landscape compared to the complex landscape. This research was 2012. Paula took a, a, a closer look at azalea lace bug. Now I'm in Southwest Ohio, we have uh, high pH soils, so we can't really grow azaleas very well, but in Maryland you can and lace bugs are a, pretty important pests. They cause stippling damage and they can really be very damaging. So she took a look at azalea lace bugs. And this could be a stand in for just about any plant pest, quite frankly. Number of lace bugs in simple. Now, <laughs> I'm going to do this and you're going to, and it's really nice that you all are using a computer screen because you can actually see it. If this is on a screen, sometimes I actually have to kind of point to it. Simple versus complex. 
Now, if that's not statistically different, I don't know what is. Again, that's what this bar is about. But just take a look at the difference between simple and complex, high diversity, low diversity, more pests in low diversity. Again, science can be mind blowing as with the virus earlier. And she took even a closer look at what happens when you add flower power. So in landscapings with just azaleas, no other flowers, just azaleas, there we have the pests, the number of, I mean, I'm sorry, the number of natural enemies in those landscapings. But then look what happens when we add flowers in the form of just coriander. And then we add flowers in the, term, in the form of, of Shasta daisy. This isn't that big a difference in, or in a big jump in diversity, but just that jump in diversity, look what it did to the number of natural enemies compared to just having azalea blooms. Again, statistically very, very significant. So let's connect the dots, flower power and natural enemies. All right, let's go back to the the little wasp, the little tiny wasp, here they are. My little side story here. These are the females that came out of this caterpillar, these uh, that came out of these cocoons. Now, a little trick with photography is that you can put insects in a refrigerator and cool them down, and then you're better able to take pictures. Unfortunately, I cooled them just a little too long and killed them. I didn't know they had a low temperature threshold, but nonetheless, here they are. Now, what do these little wasps, what do these little female wasps eat? They eat nectar. So think about that. When they emerge, the first thing they need to do is go to flowers and get some nectar. And so that powers them to be able to come back to lay eggs on more caterpillars. All of these caterpillars. This was interesting, this was last year. This is called the stink bug hunter. Stink bug hunter, what does it do? It goes after things like brown marmorated stink bug, uh, actually the nymphs. It uses its stinger to paralyze the nymphs and then it, dry, it brings the nymph back, paralyzed, takes it in its underground lair and lays an egg on the paralyzed because they don't have refrigeration. They want their offspring to have fresh meat. So they lay an egg on that paralyzed nymph. And of course, then when the egg hatches, the immature wasp can feed on that fresh meat. It's really kind of a horror story. You think about that poor little marmorated stink bug nymph just sitting there with its compound eyes looking at what's going to happen, but we won't go there too far. But what do the females wasp, oh, female wasps eat? Nectar. Do you see, <laughs> do you see the commonality here and what I'm trying to propose? I'm saying if you provide more flowers, we will get more of these. And by the way, where did I find all these wasps? At the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens, because there's plenty of nectar there for the female wasp. This is that little fly I already showed a while ago, kind of a pretty little thing called a feather leg fly. It gets its name from these little structures on its hind legs. What does it do? Well, it is a parasitoid of true bugs like brown marmorated stink bugs. And what is this adult fly eating? Nectar. So provide nectar, you'll bring these in. Let's talk about predators. Now these are called surfid flies. Sometimes they're called hover flies. They're called surfid because of the family surfidae. Now they're maggots. The immature flies eat aphids. So they're a very important aphid predator. Of course, if we look at the aphids here, these surfid flies, by the way, this is only native rose, prairie rose. Sometimes we act like roses do not attract uh, any type of beneficials, but as a matter of fact, uh, our native roses and even knockout roses, for example, commonly attract surfid flies. So those blooms do function to bring in a predator that targets aphids. Unfortunately, things like hybrid teas do not. So this is a lesson. I actually like hybrid teas. I mean, they're very nice. Got me out of trouble a few times with my wife. Hybrid tea roses, very pretty, but they, they've been bred so that they do not attract predators or parasitoids or pollinators. And so that's something we need to be mindful of. We can breed out of this. What about the beetles? Goldenrod soldier beetles, the larvae live in the soil. They feed on insect eggs and insect larvae, rootworms. 
And here we have the spotted cucumber beetle, which is also called the southern root worm. So what do you think the larvae do for this? The larvae eat the larvae of this feeding on roots. And what do the adults eat? Pollen and nectar. So you'll see these coming into flowers. You have flowers, you have pollen and nectar, you have a predator being drawn in. It's a twofer, a pollinator and a predator. Wing stem, this is a Pennsylvania leather wing. You can find them on goldenrod, golden rain tree. Look at all this on there, golden rain tree. Linden, this is the margined leather wing, same type of beetle. Quite a few that we'll track. Now here are thread wasted wasp. They also dig burrows and provision larvae with a paralyzed caterpillar or sawfly larva. So they do a little bit like what I already talked about uh, with the uh, stink bug parasitoid. And here are the larval food items, all these things. And these are sawflies over here. These are caterpillars over here. And each one of these we would normally call a plant pest. And what do the adults eat? <laughs> I know this is over and over again, but my point is just look at the diversity in enemies of plant pests. Now these are misunderstood stingers. Paper wasps, polistes, what do they do for a living? Well, up in this nest, you have these little immature wasps that are legless. They can't fend for themselves. Uh, they, they have to have the adults go out and provide protein, get protein to feed them so they will grow. And so here we can see, you know, there they are, they're little, little grub-like larvae, and they must have protein to grow. So what do the females feed these grub-like young wasps? Well, they grind up caterpillars and sawflies. This is a Catawpa hornworm caterpillar. You probably can recognize it. Unfortunately, you also recognize it was parasitized. So that's kind of a shame on one level, but that wasp is grinding it up to bring that meat back to its immatures. What do the females themselves eat though? You can see what she's eating. And that's not just this wasp. I mean, here's another form of it. Another twofer, it's a pollinator and a predator, uh, all types of difference. And by the way, yellow jackets, same idea. This yellow jacket is a pollinator, we forget that, that also will grind up meat and bring that back. So it's a predator to its, bring the meat back to feed its immatures. Yes, they can be a bit of a problem. Just put a sign in, in front of their burrows. Connecting the dots then, let's put it all together for the remainder of this talk and let's focus on a single example of how all this works. This is gonna be a case study focusing on bagworms, common bagworms. That's not bagworm. And these aren't bagworms either. I grew up in West Virginia and in Appalachia, it's common to call either one of these bagworms because their silk nests look a little bit like bags in trees, right? But they're not bagworms. This is a bagworm. What you have here is a caterpillar inside of a silk stock, sock. They are lined, this bag is, 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 is like a silk sock. And then a caterpillar uses pieces of the host plant to camouflage itself. And it's amazing how good a job they do. Now we're gonna overlay this all in something called integrated pest management. Now, many of you probably already know about this. The idea behind integrated pest management is you don't just spray. You also bring to bear other strategies involving cultural management as well as biological. We've really been focusing on biological and we're gonna do more so of that. So we're gonna talk about IPM with the common bagworm and let's talk about spraying. Well, there's a real challenge with the insecticide approach. First of all, we have asynchronous development, meaning that through the season, we can have very small bagworms which are highly susceptible at the same time, we have larger bagworms, and here's what it actually looks like. These are most susceptible at the same time that we have these that are least susceptible to insecticides. So if we did spray, we might kill these and not kill these. And that's a problem because if this is a female bagworm, she can contribute over 500 eggs for next season. So once again, there's a bit of a challenge. Insecticides we say are problematic. So let's talk about cultural management. 
and take the direct approach. Some of you are already doing this right now, and this can be pretty effective. And let's look at how we do this. First of all, we have to recognize that right now, the females are moving in this direction. They have already, the uh, female bagworms actually do not pupate like we see other moths and butterflies. They do pupate, but they never become a moth. They stay looking like something like a caterpillar. And eventually the males will mate with them. The males do look like moths and will mate with them. And then she starts producing these eggs. And this is how they spend the winter. So this is the management target. You have these bags with females inside that have eggs. And so we call this plucking the bagworms off. There's a digital IPM tool. And here I am pulling the bagworms away. There I have a handful of bagworms and a bag of bagworm. And this, then we then take this to the two-step bagworm control method. You can see what I've done. Step one is to position the bagworms on a hard surface. Now I do have to, if you, you know, young children are watching this, uh, you might want to have them, you know, walk away for a little bit because viewer discretion is advised because the next step is to do the bagworm stomp. And there's no coming back from this. Sometimes I like to pretend this is the last thing they ever saw. That's just kind of interesting. It is highly effective. And so far, no bagworms have become resistant to this control method. How about an alternate method? Well, you could burn them. You could light them up, build a little bagworm fire. That, I suppose, could be fun. But be careful if you're using fire. <laughs> Sorry, I, I forgot I put this in here. But let's talk about the biological approach for the remainder of this. What are we looking at here? This was actually a Christmas tree plantation about uh, 10 years, 10, 15 years ago. I was asked by the, uh, uh, by the grower to come out and take a look because he said he had a real bagworm problem. When I got there, I could not find any active bagworms. I kept finding bags ripped open. What ripped open this bag? Well, along the tree line were two bald-faced hornet's nest. Now, I'm not saying that was the only thing, but I do know, we do know, bald-faced hornets will use those very powerful mandibles that they usually use to grind up uh, 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 pieces of wood, wood fiber, to then be regurgitating it in the form of paper. So very powerful mandibles. And what the, the uh, um, bald-faced hornet did was use those mandibles to rip this big hole and pull out the caterpillar to grind up to bring back to its offspring. That's biological control, folks. And it's a twofer because if you pay attention to flowers, certain flowers in particular, you know, they will attract bald-faced hornets. So you might be thinking, wait a second, Joe, I don't want to have all these stinging insects coming into my garden. Well, as a matter of fact, you would really have to try hard to make this bald-faced hornet sting you. They are most aggressive if you walk up and hit their nest. I would not advise that. But they are aggressive if they're defending their nests, if they're out and about foraging, not particularly aggressive. But again, these are predators more flower power. Now what you're looking at is a bagworm that has a hole at the bottom of the bag. What's happened here? Well, what has emerged out of this bag is a parasitoid called Idoplectus conquistator. And right there it is, it's a little wasp. And you can see she's puffing out her wings. So she's on my finger. And I want you to pay attention to this. So in 1976, factors affecting the survival of larval and pupal stages of the bagworm, common bagworm, the ichneumonid Idoplectus conquistator accounted for most of the parasitism, 70, almost 76%. So we know this is a very effective parasitoid on bagworms, right? We know that. I mean, the research says that. But let's connect it to this research, conservation biological control in urban landscapes, manipulating parasitoid, uh, parasitoids of bagworms, 2005. Parasitism rates of bagworms were 71% higher in the shrubs that were surrounded by flowering forbs than in shrubs that lacked flowers. It gets even better, folks. In a third experiment, parasitism rates exceeded 70% in shrubs that were uh, adjacent to a central bed of flowering forbs, but less than 40% in shrubs that were further away. Science is pretty cool, isn't it? 
as a matter of fact, when I first came to Extension, we would uh, we discussed, okay, when could we recommend an insecticide? How effective should an insecticide be for us to recommend it? And the general agreement at that time was for an insecticide to provide at least 70% control. What's happening with this parasitoid? 70% without ever spraying. Well, what do you have to do? Well, you have to plant flowering plants. That's all I'm saying here. And don't forget the flower power of trees and shrubs. This is my good friend, Steve Foltz, who speaks for trees. Yes, he, he, will, he is one of the original tree lovers and so am I. Don't forget trees and shrubs. They are very important sources for nectar. So the bottom line is if you look at this planting, what are you seeing here? You're actually seeing a management scheme against bagworms, against other pests like these caterpillars and these sawflies. This isn't just a pollinator garden, it is a pest management garden. That is the take home. Higher diversity in flowering plants, and I know I got a little carried away, but you know, those were not even probably a fifth to maybe even less of the pictures that I have of insects that the adult stage eats nectar and pollen or nectar or pollen or both, but the immature stage is an enemy of insect pests. And this is an ecological approach to plant pest management. It is what nature does all along. If we go out to look at what happened when we talked about the lack of diversity as we move through the urban gradient, we started with nature doing this all along and we ended up when we go to monocultures with it not happening. If we can start bringing back more diversity, it will happen. Well, all these things, even butterfly gardens, well, let's call them fly gardens, all right. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm making too big a point on that, I have a little fun with it, but we're getting close to the end. I know you're all now getting up and stretching and wanting to start dancing. My final overarching point, diversify landscapes because flower power equals pest management power and maybe a few flies. The true voyage of discovery lies not in finding new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And that's what I'm trying to impart today is just providing you with some new eyes to take a look at how to best management and manage in an ecologically friendly method pests in your landscaping. And this is uh, time for questions. I think I'm actually finished right on time. So I'm going to stop sharing. And Matt, I don't know if you want to open it up to uh, I'm looking at the chat right now. Yeah, absolutely. If anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or uh, just unmute yourself and ask. But we had two come in through the chat. So the first one is from Beth. She asked, she just planted a young button bush, but the deer keep eating it. How do I protect my native trees and shrubs from deer? And Tisa jumped in and said that they use deer repellent over the summer to try to protect their plants. Is there anything else people can do? That's really it. It's, it is a shame. Uh, uh, but you know, in our urban landscaping, you know, deer are becoming, uh, have been uh, uh, becoming a major urban pest. Uh, deer repellents can and do work. And as was suggested, not all, not year round through the season. Sometimes you have to be a little careful in the winter if they run out of food and the repellents may not be quite as effective in the cold temperatures, but that's about it. And I, I, I don't have have a list of deer resistant plants because that's mostly observational. So it doesn't always stand up anyway. Carl asked, uh, these, these all native to Ohio. I'm sorry, Carl, what, what were you referring to? Is Carl still on? Yep, I'm here. I mean, oh, there, yeah. You went through the list of plants initially. Yeah. And they're good for our landscapes, and a lot of them I don't recognize. I was just curious, do you really propose or support or push native plants to be used? Oh, I think natives are wonderful. However, we don't want to ever say that the non-natives will not support pollinators. I, I think that is a misunderstanding. Uh, uh, there, uh, there are many. In fact, you go to the zoo, and uh, they actually have been 
tracking this for a number of years, natives versus non-natives. What I like natives for is just, like I said, just honoring what will grow, you know, in, in Ohio, for example. But you, as very well you should know, that word native, for example, uh, I was on a conference call early, early this week and we were looking at a, at a plant catalog and, uh, and, and they had listed native plants. And then you looked at the asterisks and you go down and look at what native where, native to the east of the Mississippi. Well, you know, a plant that evolved in Georgia, I don't think is really native to Ohio. You know, a plant that evolved up near the Arctic Circle probably isn't native to Ohio. Do you see where I'm heading? So the whole native versus non-native, I think we get a little bit too bollocked up with. It's simply a matter, are you providing sufficient nectar for the pollinators? And like I said, that's not just relegated to natives. Does that answer your question, Carl? Yep, sure did. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, oh, deer repellent. Uh, the year we had bald faced hornets in the yard, we had zero caterpillars or no veggies. That's really interesting. And uh, is it Tissa, T I S A, T T Tissa, Tissa? She, she'll unmute herself. That's a fantastic observation. Um, now, of course, obviously, you know, one rose is not a summer make. I can't say with certainty that that's the reason, but the fact of the matter is, if you do have bald faced hornet's nest or yellow jacket's nest, and I've seen this firsthand in landscapings where I've, you know, I visit land, you, you don't want me being happy in your landscaping because I, of course, go look for pests and diseases. And I have noticed, man, if there's an active yellow jacket nest at hand, you will not find sawfly larvae. I mean, they're, they're, they're just going to be, they're just going to be, they're going to be meat items right away. So, so there's definitely a, a direct connection in a localized area, but, but again, you know, the reason why I stress that is just so that we don't target these things and try to get rid of them. Obviously, if you're allergic to, you know, the stings, you need to be careful, but you know, the rest of us, you know, it means don't go to the back 40, you know, to wipe out a hornet's nest. I should have said this, bald face hornets, yellow jackets, and paper wasps only use their nest one season. They do not return the next season. That's very important. My neighbor, for example, and I've been taking pictures of it, has a bald face hornet hanging up there. Uh, I actually should have included a picture of it. And, and he's leaving it alone. And it's not bothering anybody. Again, as long as you don't bother them, they typically don't bother you, but they're doing a very good ecological service for all of us. Can you recommend three best flowering forbs that may be resist deer resistant? I can't. And the reason why I can't is because that changes. All of the so-called deer resistant plants, are the uh, results are based on observations. Deer are very, white-tailed deer are one of the most adaptable animals I've ever come across. Uh, when I came to Extension, for example, there was a monastery uh, in Cincinnati, and they, they started hanging bars of soap in a, uh, an orchard that they had, and it worked for about one season. And then the following season, the deer just got, you know, caught onto the idea. Then they started hanging, you know, you probably heard us, they go to their barber shop, other barber shops, and pick up, you know, human hair. They, they made, you know, human hair sachet bags, and well, that worked for one season and then the deer came back. They're very adaptable. So there are very few plants that I've come across where you can't say eventually, if the deer have nothing else to eat, they won't eat that plant. Now, on the other hand, if they have a lot of their preferred plants around, they may leave other plants alone, but I don't really have a list that I stand behind. But there are other people kicking in on that. So other questions? Well, you've been a, you're a quiet group. I can't possibly have answered everybody's questions. Well, Matt, it would appear that we have come to our end, right? Seems like it. Yeah, if others have questions, feel free to reach out to Dave or I. 
um, and we can get you in touch with Joe, Joe, if that's all right. Oh, that's fine. Yes. Awesome. Well, and I really do appreciate this opportunity. Again, as I said to you and Dave uh, earlier, I really like, you know, the goals and what you're hoping to accomplish. And, and I hope the presentation today and the topic will help to fit those goals by, again, you know, taking this approach of a more ecological approach to pest management, which is <laughs> just a lot of fun, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I keep, I want to go back. I'm telling all of you to plant more flowering plants. That's not hard to do, is it? No, so Matt, thank you. And thanks, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise, Joe. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Again, this is part of a GreenSpot webinar series. So we have one more in this series coming up. And also, if you are not a GreenSpot member, I encourage you to go to columbus.gov slash GreenSpot. And there you can sign up uh, to make sure that you receive all the information about future webinars and can also start tracking your, uh, your small sustainable actions that you take every day. But thank you everyone so much. And uh, thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Dave. Take care. Yeah, you as well. Bye-bye.